Hi, everyone. Welcome to our last day of Indigenous Foods Week for as part of the Winter Vegetable Sagra. Um, I am Lane Selman with the Culinary Breen Network, and I'm coming to you today with Spring Alaska, who I'm going to introduce in a moment. Um, I am in Portland, Oregon, which is on the traditional lands of the Multnomah, Clackamas, Chinook, Tualatin, Malala, and many other tribes that lived along the Columbia River that separates what we now call Oregon and Washington. Um, we are joined by Spring Alaska. Uh, her native name is Yupingsrak, I believe is how I pronounce it. And um, it means, it translates to time when the ice breaks. Beautiful name. And um, she is the owner of Sakari Farms. She was born and raised in Valdez, Alaska. And she's the daughter of Native Chief Helmer J. Olson of the Valdez Native Tribe. Um, I'm gonna read from a bio of hers from her website because it is amazing how many things that Spring does. Um, she is joining us um, from her home over in just west of Ben and Tumalo. Uh, which is in central Oregon. Um, she, her farm, uh, Sakari Farms, works in collaboration with the Central Oregon Seed Exchange uh, as a unique Deschutes County-based cold climate seed bank, offering free seed and agricultural education to the public. She also has Sakari Botanicals, which is a really great, and I encourage you to look on her website, uh, a value added product of culinary and healing tribal products that she offers. Um, the farm houses a unique Northwest tribal seed bank dedicated to regional and national tribal members only. Um, Sakari Farms is unique in that they grow Native American tribal foods, they offer on-farm technical assistance through on-farm classes and implement research-based tribal seed production. They do contract and wholesale growing of seed. Uh, and her current growing creations consist of specialty tribal peppers, tomatoes, potatoes, garlic, herbs, and flowers. Um, you can also buy some of these products. I've seen dried peppers and other items um, on her website. And the farm practices organic and biodynamic growing practices and holds the intertribal counts, agricultural councils made by Native American patent certification. Um, so you do so many things, <laughs> Spring. It's totally amazing. You're here today to, uh, I want you to talk about all the things that you want to talk about about your business. Um, and then you're going to share with us something really fun um, that is going to be a demo. You're going to show us how to create squash candy, which is another product I've seen that you sell, but how to do this at home if we want with the uh, traditional Gete Akosman squash. Um, it's a cucurbita maxima squash that has been grown by Native Americans for hundreds of years. It's a very big squash. Um, I'm very excited about it. We had an entire squash week and you know, a lot of our watchers are totally crazy about squash. So we're excited. So if you guys have that are watching, if you, I'm sure you got squash somewhere in your house, just get it. It doesn't matter if it's not super huge. I'm going to use this little one, <laughs> but just grab a squash and um, we're here to learn something very new uh, for most of us. And um, before I just hand this over to Spring, I want to remind everybody that's watching on YouTube, you've probably been on it before, chat your questions in the box and I'm going to ask them to Spring as we go along and learn and talk about squash. Thank you so much, Spring. So excited. To yeah, have thank you, you Lane. And yeah, thank you to the Culinary Breeders Network for letting me join you guys today. And it's an honor too to be able to work with uh, my peers and mentors, uh, Michelle Goodrain and Dan Cornelius. So what a great crew. It's really fun to be here. Um, I don't really know where to start. There's so much to talk about, but I'll just do a baby intro. Um, Kirkabita Maxima is the squash. Um, this was gifted to me, uh, driven down from Michigan, my really good friends and mentors, uh, a tribal chef, Elena Terry, and Rosebud Bear, who manages um, her farm up there in Michigan, brought me this beautiful Gete squash that we just cut in half for the demo. Um, like a lot of the squashes, um, we do honor this traditional seed and the squash. It provides so many um, nutritional value and uses for us. It has a long shelf life. I think this came out to me in October. It was starting to get a little funky on the ends that is common with 
a lot of squashes. I did bring a curie squash. We had a really bad hailstorm this year. So all the squashes we grew either were this big <laughs> or we were able to get something this size. So I did bring some other uh, non-native squashes. This delicata squash is gifted to us from another farmer, but I'm sure you guys all have some really fun squashes that you have in your cupboard too or in your cold storage. Um, having it in a dark, cool room, we noticed really helped uh, the longevity of keeping this squash. So it's really cool in like mid-February that we're pulling these out and still able to eat them. So I think that, and what we're gonna learn today is some uh, ways that we preserve this squash so that you can keep it. Um, I've had some of the squash that we preserved and made into candy for a year. And I've noticed too that when yeah. um, you do make something like this, if it's out in the light, which I had accidentally left it here on like this little shelf that I have behind me where I keep some of our native plants that we use in our products, um, it got a little light damaged. So that was a lesson that I learned to kind of keep it, keep it away in the dark. But um, what I want to talk about the squash real quick is it's high in vitamin C, uh, B and B5 and A. It's combative for uh, cancer. It has a ton of different nutritional qualities and values. This specific squash tastes and smells like honeydew right now. This whole shop is just full of this like beautiful smell. Um, and I wanted to talk about seeds real quick. Um, there's some seeds that I had saved from last year or from this year that we've cleaned previously. Um, we're currently, I don't know if anyone's noticed, trying to get on Baker Creek or Territorial or your other favorite uh, national or regional seed company, but there's another seed shortage with the increase in uh, COVID and the Victory Garden phenomenon. So I'm really glad everyone's growing food and learning about gardening and becoming self-sufficient. But at the same time, I thought I'd use this opportunity uh, to show the importance of the whole plant theory of how tribal members, uh, we use every part of the plant. I'm not that familiar with using the leaves at this point, uh, but we're gonna talk mainly about the meat of this squash and the seeds. So um, when you, whenever you cut your squash open, which you'll be doing later this evening, hopefully for dinner, is there'll be um, a good amount of seed in there. So we usually take, um, you can take a spoon. A lot of people use a, a nice big spoon mm -hmm. and you can kind of core it out. Mm -hmm. I like to use my hands for everything. Um, so you can kind of get a feel from the difference between the meat and the seed. It's pretty meaty. Um, like this is just what it looks like when it comes off. So we uh, run it through under the sink and just start to separate the seed from the meat. I don't like to soak things too long. I don't want to jeopardize the integrity of the genetics of the seed. Um, and then what you can do is take the seed when you're done uh, kind of rinsing it off and getting that meat off and using we have a Excalibur dehydrator or you can use whatever you want. Do not put this in the dehydrator. This is just a nice sheet pan that I'm using, but you can take the seed, spread it out. It's nice and clean. And when it's done, it'll have this like whiskey film on it, which is that dehydrated or that dried kind of skin. And then it's ready to go. And you can germinate that whenever you're ready to just test to make sure that the seed viability is good. But I just wanted everyone to see that Please don't waste the seed. It's really easy to clean and save. You can put it in a brown paper bag, uh, label it and put it away for a few months until it's growing season. Um, because it has so much seed, share it. Um, you don't need a lot of, these plants get huge, especially this one. Mm -hmm. um, the leaves get big. Mm -hmm. The whole plant is gigantic. So you don't need to grow a lot of it if you're just having like your own family garden. Um, so save the seed and share it. There's a lot of seed swaps going on online right now. A lot of people are um, sending each other packets with a few seeds in there. So just try and remember that there's a food shortage, mm -hmm. there's a seed shortage, and this is a great opportunity. It's a really easy seed to learn from. So go through there and kind of core out, core out your seeds. I'm gonna ask you, how, how many fruits do you get on a plant? So if you've grown this in your yard, like are you getting like two or like 10 fruits per plant? Do you know? I think it depends. I am often uh, over harvesting squash blossoms hmm, for yeah. other tribal chefs. We uh, on contract to grow for like Crystal Weewapa who makes these amazing like energy health bars that are all like all the ingredients are native uh, grown. So I'm a cheater. I'm always taking the blossoms off. Uh, this year we're gonna designate specific greenhouses just for the fruit or the meat. So um, I would say anywhere from like three to three to eight depending on rodents, weather, wildfire, smoke, all these things that 
we all experienced last year. So, (laughs) you know, planting like two or three plants themselves should be plenty for the winter. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, I guess I'll jump right into it. So once you clean this, uh, a a good amount of the seed out, it'll still be kind of meaty and whiskey. So then you can take that spoon and scrape it. And then it turns into this really nice looking, sorry, I'm trying to look at my laptop and the camera. This really nice looking, uh, you can quarter this large squash, or even if you have a small one, just cut it in half. Um, And then you can take your knife and kind of go through and just make like, um, these are kind of like quarter to half inch slices. I don't know if you can see them. Mm -hmm. And this is what we're doing is we're making squash candy. Um, I'll just grab what it looks like in the end so you can kind of get an idea of of the end result, it's really cool. Um, You're leaving the skin just, on it? You don't, you, are you peeling off the skin or anything? Yeah, you wanna go through and take the skin off. We cheated today just for the demo, but mm-hmm. you can just take your knife and, and gently just kind of start chipping away at it, you know, like that. Or sometimes if you're lucky, one of those cucumber peelers yes. might help, but you wanna wash your uh, knuckles. Mm-hmm. Um, so what happens is when you, um, I'll show you guys how we make this, but this is what it ends up being like this little teeny, um, piece of dry candy. It's pretty hard. Um, it lasts forever. It's something you can like put in your pocket when you're skiing or going on a hike, pull it out and get it dissolved in your mouth. And those natural sugars that we're going to talk about that we're adding to it, um, will come back out. It has this like almost fruit loop flavor, this really sweet honeydew flavor. Um, so it's a really tasty, healthy treat, uh, for kids too. And again, it's full of vitamin C and nutri- other nutritional values, minerals, um, so it's, you dry it, you label it after you're done, but it's comes out to be, it kind of, when you put it in that dehydrator, it ends up pulling all that natural water out mm-hmm. and it lasts mm-hmm. forever. It tastes really good. And then it's kind of, um, it'll substitute the candy bar and all the little fruit snacks that we have because, um, it's maple sugar. So that's what we're going to use today. It's a derivative that they cook down maple syrup that Mm -hmm. comes right out of the trees. This is from Mm -hmm. our tribal friends in Michigan. Um, So they cook down this maple sugar and it's, uh, it almost smells kind of like ambrosia. It's like kind of a brown sugar. It's Mm -hmm. so tasty, a little goes a long way. But the way that we're gonna make squash candy today is you just take a bowl after you've sliced up, you can do as many as you want. Um, Traditionally for our tribal food cooking classes, we just cut the whole squash up because we need the volume to feed the kids and show them. And then they can go home with it. But you can just take the squash and put it in there, the strips. And then you can take your maple sugar, um, kind of grind it up a little bit, sprinkle as much as you want on there. I don't measure a lot of natives. We just, (laughs) everything's by the eye. Um, And then I brought some stuff that's kind of fun alternatives you can add to it. It's fine just doing sugar, um, stir it up and put that need a dehydrator, but I wanted to show you guys some other alternatives. Um, I got some dehydrated blueberries. And so what you can do is kind of mush them up into a fine powder and sprinkle it on top of there. So now you have this like antioxidant blueberry in there. It's already dehydrated. It's gonna last as long as the squash does with the sugar on it. So you have a maple sugar blueberry squash candy. It is so good down the road. Um, and what you can do, or if you want to, if you don't have access to maple sugar, sometimes it's hard to get. You can also just coat your ma- your um, squash in maple syrup. Um, there's also, just for fun, you can use choke cherry jelly, uh, rose hip jams. It's, mm. You can kind of use, if you're not cooking it in an oven where sometimes it'll reduce and become like a gel. Mm -hmm. Um, you're just dehydrating it. So it just kind of attaches itself to the squash and that's it. So then you take, you mix it up, whatever you choose to use and you get your dehydrator plate out. And again, this is just a quick video, but um, you just kind of evenly distribute them. And there you go, you put in a dehydrator. I'm not gonna say for how long or what time because everyone has their different ways of doing it. But that's how we make squash candy. Um, I have some other ways to, to use squash if you wanna talk about that, Lane, or I didn't know if you had any other questions, but that was kind of the quick version of how we make squash candy. Just to remind you again, when it's done, make sure you put it, um, we vac seal everything. 
it seems to have a longer, some more longevity to it um, with shelf life, but make sure you label when you made it, um, what it was, maybe what you added to it in case there's any anomalies. And uh, blueberry also has this byproduct we have in plant dyes where it produces a green color. So in six months, when you pull that out and it's green, it's not mold, it's that natural dye from the blueberry mm -hmm. that is kind of resonating throughout wash candy after it's been dried. So. So it's, if you were to use the maple sugar and say like the dried um, blueberries, it adheres to it okay enough to like, as you put it on the, oh, yeah. yeah. It's because um, when you cut the squash, it needs to breathe a little bit. It starts mm -hmm. to beat up okay. natural water yeah. comes out of it. And that's kind of this adhesive that I found. Mm -hmm. um, and all this is just what I've learned from my opinion. So I'm sure there's other ways to do it, but it seems like the squash just has this natural way of pulling it in. Mm -hmm. And so I do let the squash candy sit for about 10, 15 minutes before I put it in just so it can kind of do its thing, absorb those sugars. And the more you um, grind down whatever berry you choose, we use blackberries too. Um, mm -hmm. The smaller that grain is or powder, the easier it is for it to adhere to that squash candy. Mm -hmm. So someone's asking if you could make it without a dehydrator, like, is there a way that you could dry it, like hang it and dry it or something? I mean, you know, obviously since this is not the summertime, it's a hard time to dry things outside, but. Yeah. Um, I, I've actually never done it in the summer and we have to remember our old traditional ways that we used to hang, you know, everyone smokes meat now in shacks and uses dehydrators for smoking salmon um, sometimes we have to remember in the old days, we didn't have dehydrators. So mm -hmm. you can take it um, and tie strings around it and hang it from a log in the summer and get that direct sun or something in the shade where there's some breeze to kind of, you wanna mm -hmm. make sure that the bugs don't get to it because whenever I think of sugar and fruits outside in the sun, I think of fruit flies, uh, hornets, wasps. Yes. <laughs> think of something, ants will find their way onto it too. So hanging it, in an open air setting. Um, I haven't done that yet, but those are all, all traditional ways of like when we, um, when we catch our salmon, we wind dry it. So you hang it over different materials to wind dry. So we've always naturally used the sun and the wind uh, in our favor. So there is a way to do, I wish I had a better uh, example of how to do that this time of year, because we don't have a lot of sun. There's a lot of moisture in the air specifically in the next 24 hours with a storm coming. Um, I guess I'm worried if you do put it in the oven, then we're turning it into this roasted baked thing that we're all so used to doing. And that's why I chose to not talk mm. about putting it in the oven today. It was more like, let's make something sweet because we're dealing with obesity, heart disease, the yep. kids are on the phone all the time. They're grabbing something quick, getting back on the phone. And this encourages them to go out, harvest that plant material, prep, learn with an adult, engage, get some fresh air, and learn a new way to substitute those sugars that are unhealthy. And the maple sugar is a healthy sugar, um, mm -hmm. full of zinc, calcium, potassium, and iron. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the positive things about this demo is it's our using our traditional foods and using these value-added products um, to kind of encourage different ways of eating it and, and preserving it too. Yeah, I mean, for people that don't have a dehydrator, I do encourage you, you can look, I mean, there. it seems like there are a lot of times at Goodwill and you can get them for a really good deal. But once you start using dehydrators, yeah. you use them for all kinds of things. You know, fig, you know, figs are something that I like to eat a lot of and they're everywhere. They're very plentiful and people don't eat all that they have usually, and you can go pick them just run, walking around town. <laughs> and, and, but they are very fragile and they don't last long, but you can, you know, uh, dry them. Um, all the peppers too. It is hard in this climate to, I, I really like images of, of, you know, drying peppers and tomatoes and all these things. And it can be really hard in our climate to dry things. Um, like we, we don't have that heat, you know, like, um, I'm, I really like astracho, which is like a Sicilian thing that you do. And we used to do it in Florida growing up as you take all your, the tomatoes and you make kind of like a paste and then you put it out on a big piece of wood and you just pour, you know, you're making tomato paste many, many days. And, you know, you always have to deal with all the insects and everything, but, and then yep. you drop it down, 
Um, but we don't have that type of heat. So we have to do it with like dehydrators if we're going to do it at all. So they, I feel like I see yeah. them a lot of times for very good deals at, at Goodwill. So just so people know, yeah. I think they're great. Um, and then someone asked if you ever have done anything like this with summer squash. I haven't, I haven't had time to get to that yet. <laughs> That's always about the get day. Yeah. Um, which is a good thing, but I have not, um, I, you know, I have these other squashes here. Mm -hmm. They all have different palatable flavors and also thickness and consistency. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where you just have to experiment with, with what's your favorite. A lot of people, delicata, a lot of people, curie, everyone's got their, they're like squash fanatics, like you were saying. So everyone has their favorite. So mm -hmm. you just have to see what you want to yeah. do with it. Um, I brought some other examples too, if I can show you of other ways to use your squash or this one, which we'll probably be doing tonight because we have an excess now of squash and I need to use some for squash candy for cooking classes coming up. But um, if you want to stay on the sweet side again, honey, you can, you can pour honey on it. Um, you can always use any kind of jam. There's maple sugar, but what we're probably going to do tonight, there's two different ways we might, um, use one of our friends wild rice that they gather over um, in Minnesota and Michigan um, with smoked pork belly. Oh yeah. And then maybe put some smoked Gouda in there. Mm -hmm. um, you can also, we have smoked pinion pine salt that's really good too. So using a conifer or a pine adds a little twist of pungent to it. And this is full of vitamin C and A too. Um, the salt's not the best for you, but um, there's, you can take any squash that you have and always add food to it, um, a grain, a meat to it, um, and also jams. It's always nice to put jams in there. And then the other last, uh, there's one more thing I was going to show you is that we grow blue corn here, which is amazing. Uh, a lot of nutritional value in this too. And we make, um, blackberry and blueberry blue corn flour. So this is uh, similar to a masa or something you would make muffins with or tortillas. But what you can do is take your squash and make it into little cubes and you can roll it in a blue corn flour and it can have berries in it too um, or some salt. And then you can um, deep fry those. Mm -hmm. So then you have these like little blue flour squash treats. Oh, that's cool. Um, and then if you get really desperate and you don't know what to do with your squash, um, we make hot sauce with it. <laughs> this is a pumpkin, Maruga pumpkin hot sauce that we made this year that has more of a curry flavor to it, which is awesome. So I would just encourage everyone to experiment with their squashes and maybe get out of the box a little bit. Everyone's always stuffing it and throwing it in the oven, but you know, you can fry it in olive oil. Um, mm -hmm. You can add some locally farmed goat cheeses. You have tons of farms around you. Add more berries as much vitamin C and antioxidants that you can get into your health system is good for your heart, your blood flow, um, your gut. Mm -hmm. So just trying to get out of the box a little bit and use other, you know, plant materials, use dill, thyme, mm -hmm. rosemary, grow your own food and start to teach yourself like, cause in this time of COVID um, it's been hard to access those special specialty foods that we need sometimes. So you kind of have to work with what you have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love these ideas. I've never heard of that, like the cornmeal, what you're talking about, and jams and frying it. I mean, that sounds really fantastic. Yeah, you can make like little squash patties. Um, you can cook it down. You can actually bake it. Um, my mm -hmm. friend, Alina Terry, who's a chef, she when she was here, she baked it with maple. She just dumped maple sugar on this, threw it in the oven and baked it. And then we pulled it out and put it in the food processor with some uh, blue corn flour and made mush patties. Mm -hmm. And then you fry them in the mm -hmm. pan and then you can come over after and do like a homemade whipped cream yeah. and then throw on your rosemary mm -hmm. or your rose hip jam or your blackberry jam. Everyone has jams in their cupboards from their parents. Mm -hmm. So grab one of those that's been there forever that you need to use mm -hmm. and honor that that food. And, you know, re evaluate your palate and remind it that the, the fruit is good and it's good with squash also. Yeah, that sounds great. Oh, okay. Someone wants to get some more details on the hot sauce. 
<laughs> so the hot sauce that you make, what, what's that all about? Is that, is that um, the same squash? Is it the gete or is it a different squash? And like, no. and what do you use it on? What, what types of things? So this just, we're foodies over here. So um, we actually took our children's pumpkins that, cause they're teenagers and weren't as interested in, in carving pumpkins this year. <laughs> so um, we did that for them and had fun with that. And then we took the leftover pumpkin material and um, we, I'm just gonna read from here. It's roasted pumpkin, onions, scorpion peppers that we grow, uh, tribal garlic. We did cheat and used apple cider vinegar, uh, brown sugar, ginger. We don't grow ginger here. Mm -hmm. um, our business is you know, primarily focused on only using what we grow. Mm -hmm. So we do cheat sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, coriander, cumin, turmeric, which is good for you, allspice, cinnamon, paprika, and butter, because we use the butter inside the pumpkin to roast. Mm -hmm. And this mm -hmm. is pretty hot, and it's it's like a curry mm -hmm. because it has that ginger mm -hmm. and turmeric in there. So it's basically a curry sauce. It's so good, and it's very hot. I don't really do hot foods very well, but uh, my husband, they've been pouring it on vanilla ice cream too. Whoa. It's really good. So <laughs> what I would do if you call me, I know, right? we're foodies. So what you want to do, if you want to make your own squash hot sauce is just Google it, mm -hmm. um, get on Pinterest mm -hmm. probably, and just look at all the awesome different varieties and maybe be creative and come up with your own, add your own variety to it. Mm -hmm. You can throw some green curry powder mm -hmm. in there or paste, which would be really good too. It's mm -hmm. a great way to kind of utilize that extra meat instead of just doing the same old thing with it. Yes, I think that's like- And we have hot sauces. Yes. Right. As these are what happens a lot with squashes. And we talk about this, you know, quite a bit in our squash work is like just different ways of using it and not just, you know, baking it and making it into this like pureed mush. And you're like, now what am I gonna do with it? You know, um, and you know, you- It was you make a with the pumpkin because everyone's like, everyone's like pumpkin pie. And we're like, nah, let's make hot sauce. Cause no right. one's- I've never had pumpkin hot sauce and yeah. it's really not that pumpkin-y, it's curry like So it's just, yeah, it's, we got to get out of the box of the same old thing. And it helps our bodies too, to kind of change what we're eating all the time. And, and then sharing it with people too, it encourages them to get outside the box of that palate mm -hmm. range. That's, there's really hot, like, cause you see in hot sauces, a lot of times they use carrots to cut because it's so hot that you have to like have some sort of other filler. You can't just keep adding more peppers or else you'll, ne you'll never be able to eat it at all. Let me see. Oh yeah. Someone's saying that she, they grew up with sweet potato pie. Um, and some people think of it as a side dish. You could see, she could see using squash cookies and brownies and muffins. I definitely do this because I also have a teenager that doesn't want to eat, you know, vegetables half the time. So, you know, I'm just like throwing it into things like pancakes and muffins and this and that to try to get it into his body. Oh yeah. <laughs> I forgot to say that, um, another, I don't, you probably can't see very well, but there's this, this really fine orange powder here. And what I had done is taken the, the squash blossom or the, the squash candy and run it through a little food mill and it's made this squash powder. Well, I think I talked about that with crystal wheel cause foods, but, um, you, you can use this powder and just put it in muffins, mm -hmm. cakes, um, zucchini bread. Like this is another like instant shakes, your health shakes. If mm -hmm. you're doing that, um, it's just instant gratification. And of course you're preserving that food again and it lasts forever. So yeah. if you, if you get really tired of it and you can't think of any other way, grind it into powder and you can use it on anything. <coughs> I love that. I feel like I don't do powders, but whenever I see farms that do that as like a value added, like Groundwork has a lot of like, they do this with the tops of leeks and they dehydrate it and make a powder. They, it's like really fantastic kind of like intensified flavor. Um, and I really need to use that more often and use my dehydrator to do, to do this as well. I wanted to get back to something that I thought was really interesting that you talked about using squash leaves. And I don't know, I know you say you haven't been doing that yet, but like, I don't know much about that. There's a, there's a gourd in Sicily that, um, Kakutza that people use the vines and the leaves quite a bit in like a soup and in pastas and this and that. But I don't 
and I know that sweet potato vines people use, um, but I hadn't heard of people using um, like winter squash leaves. Do you know much about that and how they're how they're used? I, mean, I so don't, really and I quickly. <laughs> yeah, I feel bad that I'm not there yet. Just because I think it's because I have a little bit too much going on that <laughs> you know That's the whole plant okay. theory to me normally applies to like. Um, the medicine that we grow, like if we're growing yarrow, um, you use the whole plant in all different facets, roses, you use the hips, the flowers, the leaves, raspberry leaf. Mm -hmm. I mean, we use the brand for jewelry and shoes. Um, because I'm from a culture in the Arctic where we do not have traditional three sister gardens, mm -hmm. um, you can't squashes and pumpkins in Alaska obviously we have these like world record size thousand pound pumpkins um but in my culture we're a hunter gatherer and that's more common here in the Pacific Northwest it'll probably get me in trouble but there's not a lot of squash growing so I don't have that background like I would with mm -hmm. a berry or root or a medicine like a yarrow where I can be like boom I know how to use it the whole plant right um I feel like there would be a lot of potassium byproduct and calcium um, that would be in the leaves that would be really good for you for like a soup stock or mm -hmm. even for wounds. Like I just haven't gotten there and it's my own fault because these are really um, foreign to me. Yeah. Um, beans, squash, corn. It's just not what our culture is accustomed to. Um, and so I don't have that plant knowledge, but it's coming with time because my peers and mentors, Sean Sherman, Brian Yazzie, Michael Allen, all of these, uh, Crystal Wewapa, Tanya Brandt, all these incredible tribal chefs, we're all, we're, everyone's growing food for them. They're cooking with it, letting us know how it turns out, cooking, doing cooking classes and education. And so it, it'll come with time and I know they'll help me with figuring out, I'm sure I'll get a call as soon as we're done here and be like, you should have used a leaf with <laughs> you should have said to do this. So I don't know, but I feel like it has like a bunch of iron in it or something really useful. Yeah. Um, yeah. Probably as a stock, you know, a fluid. What about the blossoms? You use those a lot. Do you stuff like do you use them as and like stuff them with cheese and uh, grains maybe and fry them or what do you, we, what do, you do with that? Yeah, definitely a lot of that. I'm a big dairy girl, so I love goat cheese and goudas and smoked mozzarellas. Um, what I do re more the last two years is um, I just dehydrate them and ship them off to my travel chefs. It's a beautiful way to showcase whatever food or dessert you're cooking. It's very high in nutritional value, vitamin C and A, that dried squash blossom. And then again, we make lots of powder with it because then you're throwing it in your brand muffins, your cakes. Um, pancake, whatever, fry bread. I know that's very controversial, but you can start to incorporate it um, in all of your food systems. When I say powder, I'm not talking about throwing it in a shake though. Mm -hmm. It's more um, to be respected and used wisely because it is hard to grow squash sometimes where we live. It's laborious to pick it. Um, and you, it's, it's plant medicine too. And it's, these are ancestral seeds. This is an it's a very old squash and a lot of our traditional foods um, have come a long way. And so we don't want to really just start mass producing squash blossom powder. Um, but it does have its function and we basically over harvest it just to get it out to the tribal chefs so they can use it more nationally. Mm -hmm. Wait, I've, yeah, I've never had it dried before. That sounds wonderful. Yeah, but they are it's good. It they're very precious, you know, all the yeah. time, you know, they're, they are, um, uh, you know, a very unique and, um, I think, yeah, just special culinary item. Yeah. It's, it's a fun byproduct of the plant and it's an important part too. It's, it's the pollinator, the fertilizer. So we're yeah. not always taking all of it. It has its function. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like with the elder flower, it gets over harvested. And then the people who aren't native don't realize that there's no elder berry that it'll produce. So yeah. it's, we have to be cautious of, of specifically how much quantity we do take, but it does have a function in the culinary world for tribal chefs. It's been really fun to introduce it, reintroduce it, <clears throat> have it more commonly used around the country. So mm -hmm. there's the good side to it. Yes. Yeah. We were, that was touched upon yesterday too, is like over, 
over foraging and over harvesting these things and not harvesting in a respectful manner that leaves enough for others. Um, Michelle mentioned something yesterday where it was like every seventh plant you leave, you know, like when they were harvesting huckleberries or, um, and then the way that the manner that they were like harvesting huckleberries by hand instead of, I guess some people would take coffee cans and make them kind of jag, like metal uh, coffee cans and make them kind of jagged and kind of harm the plant along the way and take leaves that would leave the, the plant kind of struggling. So, you know, just being very um, respectful and, and thoughtful about, you know, what you're doing, what you're taking and leaving um, some for others as well as the plant to recover. Yeah, um, I think, well, there's this traditional berry picker that is kind of like this scoop mm -hmm. and you set it on the plant and you pull back and it just strips the leaves and the mm -hmm. berries. And so that's not functional for being sustainable um, and using your subsistence rights um, because we hand pick berries, we're selective with the bushes and a lot of those bushes and regions that we collect in are, are family-based. And a lot of people don't know when they go into the forest or the mountains and they take a bunch and they bring their whole family and it's really fun and it's nice to get everybody out, but they're just coming back with gallons and gallons. And then when we go back up and that's actually our family spot and they're gone and that tree has been damaged, um, you yeah. know, that's another whole class we can, we can, yeah. <laughs> that's a whole breeders network that we can talk about as berry harvesting, but it's important because I'm trying to talk about using blueberries on our squash candy and they're getting over harvested. So mm -hmm. it's something we need to think about down the road. It's gonna take a lot of internal resolution of people who are used to doing things the old ways or um, it'd be cool too if people go over harvest all these huckleberries, if maybe they would give half to the tribal members mm -hmm. that, to their closest, you know, cause everyone's like, well, we live on these lands and we're near these people and we're doing land acknowledgements. We'll actually do a land acknowledgement by asking if they need fish when you go out and take too much, which is mm -hmm. too much always, or, or giving back some berries, de maybe dehydrate them and drop them off at the tribal office for the resource, you know, the cultural department so mm -hmm. that they can have them for mm -hmm. their cooking classes. Um, that's yeah. just something that we hope that people yeah. will learn. It's going to take a lot, but you know, if you ever grab berries, you know, maybe share some and, and that, that'll make you feel better that you're doing something right too, mm -hmm. because they're not necessarily everybody's it's medicine too. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Um, there's a question here um, that says, can spring talk about what she sees for the future of indigenous food and cuisine, your concerns and also what you're hopeful for. Ooh, it's exploding. We're super excited about it. Um, when Elena Terry and Rosebud Bear visited me um, to thank me for what I'm doing and encourage me to continue doing it, they wanted to emphasize that as chefs, they need more tribal foods produced. And so that encourages tribal farmers to grow more food, um, be for, more familiar with producing more of specialty varieties more ancestral seed that has been shared amongst us that stays amongst us. Um, so I think that that it's literally exploding. There's um, 10 years ago or even five years ago, you wouldn't see a Sean Sherman or a Yazi um, up on screen or, or Elena Terry or Loretta teaching these classes. Um, there's more food sovereignty conferences now. The more uh, exposure and awareness we have of getting all of the tribal folks together from around the regions and country helps us meet each other and see what we need from each other. Cause that's how tribal members work is always giving and sharing and trading. Um, Intertribal uh, inter -tribal trade routes where I take plant materials from our native nursery over to the Grand Ron and they trade with us with camas plants. Um, it's just gonna continue to grow. I think our health and our mental health will become better because it all goes back to seeds and food and nutrition and being around your elders and engaging with people and being outside. Um, so I think it's going to explode. I don't really have a lot of concerns other than it needs to stay, you know, tribal people need to uh, have tribal food. We need to keep it within the tribal um, entities <clears throat> and because it's respected food, it's not abused or uh, over harvested. And I think 
just having people respect that we really embrace our ancestors and our seed because a lot of people are growing our corn and it's not really theirs. It gets um, the genetics really get kind of taken away and the, the high nutritional value when people start to just outgrow. Um, so that's the only concern is that our tribal seed needs to be protected mm -hmm. um, and just shared amongst tribal members only um, to encourage them to grow more and share. But I don't really have a lot of concerns, but the food movement is fun. There's cookbooks coming out. Um, people are going to be like, oh, squash candy. Uh, I want to make more of it, you know? So um, people hopefully will start to support other tribal food producers that are everything I've ever had from another tribal producer is amazing. Mm -hmm. So it, it's encouraging non-natives to, to um, get out their checkbook, support their tribal food producer, because it it's helping us know that it's working too. Mm -hmm. And we're getting more of that healthy nutritional food out into the community. Um, yeah, it's working. So I'm really excited. And a lot of the work I do too, is to educate and bring in other youth and young adults to teach them how to cook and farm from scratch, how to start their farm business or their food business from scratch. So I'm doing all I can to get the reach out there to see if I can grab as many you know youth out there as possible to help them learn how to become more uh, self-sufficient and determined on their own. So it's positive. It's it's moving forward. I'm really excited about it. That's great. Um, is there a cookbook that you recommend if people are watching that they might want to pick up and learn more about how to prepare tribal food? Um. I, off the top of my head, I don't have any favorites. Um, Sean Sherman has his uh, James James Beard awarded book, so mm -hmm. that would be the. I can't think of the name of it right now. The the, shoot, the Sioux Chef. Um, we, you guys can support him and his efforts. Um, I know you can get a lot of information online on YouTube about versus cookbooks. Um, there's wild berries on YouTube. There's chef Brian Yazzie. There's a lot of crystal Weewapa. You can look up Weewapa kitchen. So I would say go more virtual and try and um, get on Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube and just watch somebody do it. And that's the easiest way to do it. Great. And how can people support you? You have a really fantastic website with a lot of products with your botanicals line, um, there's food culinary products and herbal products um, for healing. Um, so I'd encourage people to go on there. It's, is it securibotanicals.com? Uh, yeah, it's securibotanicals.com. Um, and then we also do a lot of, um, we have a tribal seed bank, so that is not a subsidized thing. We don't do financial swapping for that, but um, we do have Sakari Farms at Venmo, so we're always taking uh, donations uh, because we make tribal food boxes in like summer to late fall and mm -hmm. donate those up to Warm Springs or to the community college here, the tribal program. So if anyone ever wants to throw down five or 10 bucks at, at Venmo, that's awesome too, because it goes right back into the community and it helps us, you know, make more of things and provide more for them every year. The program has been growing quite a bit. Some people are um, definitely, and um, I want to get back to the, ask you a couple things about seeds. Someone just said that Dan Cornelius mentioned that there's a native producer directory um, that you can look at online. Um, and then someone else thanks you for describing many novel ways of using squash. This is Alex Stone, who has been working on winter squash and specifically like looking at different types of squash that people aren't, you know, you go to the grocery store and it's like over here, it's like delicata squash and butternut primarily, yeah. you know, and a delicata typically doesn't like, uh, doesn't store that well. And so these other uh, more unusual squash that, uh, but they that grow really well and also store very well so that we have more things to eat and for farmers have to sell in the winter time um, is like says this is very inspirational. She's really excited about it and says that there is an indigenous culinary competition with videos. Um, I'm not sure where we can find that, but we can try to find that somewhere online. Um, 
So your seed work, I know that you are going to be, I mean, I know you're doing a lot of talks right now <laughs> and that you're going to be on a seed panel for uh, Slow Food Portland is putting on for International Women's Day on March 7th. Um, you're in, and is your seed, I'm sorry, let me, I can't, you might've said this, and I might've forgotten. Is your seed available to uh, tribal members as well as non-natives too? Um, and are those seed, no. I mean, no, so I have the central. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I have the central organ seed exchange. I started it before we got this farm, and that is a basic uh, non-native Deschutes County uh, seed. It's like a, a an old fridge at like a co-op where you go in and you pull a drawer out and you can pick whatever seeds you want. They're a dollar a packet, or um, you can donate and swap it out. So it's a seed swap seed exchange. Mm -hmm. I have a separate Sakari Farms mm -hmm. Tribal Seed Bank that is tribal seed only that we grow here that's been gifted to us from other tribal members that we grow and give back to those tribal members. Um, but that is open to all tribal members. It needs to be grown, send us some back, and then you redistribute it to tribal members only um, because we don't want it to get loose, right. which we've seen happen to the corn it ends up in a catalog. Mm -hmm. um, so that what you can do, um, is you can email us at sakarifarms at gmail.com or just get on Sakari Farms or Instagram and shoot me a message. And I have an application form. It's a community application form where what tribe are you from? What are you going to do with it? How are you going to use it? What's your address? You know, very simple, but that way we can document where the seed went um, and encourage people to kind of move it around. But yeah, that's open and free to everybody that is a tribal member. That's great. So, and that and that's and it's exciting. Tomatoes, peppers, garlic. What the um, the native garlic? Um, can you talk a little bit about that? We had a, um, a a garlic week at the. There was the first week that we did for the Sagra and had a lot of very interesting people talking about um, garlic. And I wonder what is the native garlic that you you grow? That we have a a, a purple garlic. It's mm -hmm. very like the whole outside um, casing is purple with like white striations through it. Um, we haven't got it to grow as large as we'd like to, cause we've had a lot of weather issues over the years and we have just purchased a farmer on year three or four. So it takes years to get that soil depth. We are on a lava bed. So there's short soil. It's not as healthy as it could be. Um, this land is in recovery anyway, from the people who had owned it before us that never used it. So our garlic isn't getting as big and popular as everyone else's, but it's a really strong, very flavorful purple garlic. Mm -hmm. And so that is one of the things that goes mm -hmm. in our the tribal seed packet. So we do most of the vegetables, I'll be vague, um, a lot of native plants. There's a lot of native medicinal seed that goes in there, um, a lot of berry seed. So it's it's a wide range of seed that you'll be getting. And, and usually we'll send a list of what we have and you can pick that out and we'll shoot back what we have. Um, a lot of it is already designated for warm springs and some of the efforts we're doing hopefully um, to encourage them to continue with tribal food production, but there's still some left. I know we just mm -hmm. sent some a few weeks ago to Good Rain for some of her programs. So yeah, just let us know the seed is here. It'll probably be gone in a few weeks for the year because there is such a seed shortage and we've already allocated what we need uh, for the farm too, mm -hmm. for producing food. So. That's great. Yeah, the Colville, someone from the Colville Reservation talked during Garlic Week, and she was talking about distributing garlic to tribal members, you know, there that lived on the reservation to inspire them to plant it and grow it. And, and, and you, can, you know, you could use, do that in a very small area, or you could just eat it, right? But it's like to, to kind of connect back to traditional foods um, and specific varieties um, and, and, and cook with those and kind of feel like more connected um, I love that. Um, someone, uh, so as Alex again says that she says, uh, also I love the strategies to candy, dry and powder squash to extend the season. Um, bringing back, we always say we're bringing winter back to winter squash because as you see in the grocery stores, they keep having like, well, they have winter squash year round, but then you start getting like seeing local winter squash at the markets, you know, in like August and September it's like it's too early like let's just wait and eat it during the winter so 
we always say that, um, you know, and then we can do that through this type of processing and preserving. Um, and she says, I think you can do that for summer squash too. And, you know, po yeah, possibly. Um, I know, I feel like we have, we should have like a, uh, pro, uh, project where we, because in, uh, in all different cultures too, there's all these different types of preservation. I mean, there's similar preservation methods where it's drying or canning or pickling and all this, but there's different ways that each culture goes about it. And they're all very interesting and inspiring of like new ways to, to keep our food in the winter time so that we, you know, the, the whole idea with this winter vegetable sagra is to get people very excited about winter food. So we're eating local winter foods um, instead of, we, we, you know, we have these fair weather local eaters where, you know, during the height of the season when everything's really nice and you can go, to, you know, pre-COVID, you go to the farmer's market and it's like, you know, you bring the stroller and the dog and there's music and it's like an outing, you know, it's like a social event, which is great. But, you know, and then as soon as yeah. it's rain and then, you know, there's lots of wonderful sweet flavors and there's so much diversity and then it starts raining and then, you know, there's less things to eat and they're like, well, do I really want to go to the, you know, in the rain? There's, you know, it's not like a social event anymore. And now, you know, we just rutabagas. And so, <laughs> and so it's like, and they go to the grocery store and buy, you know, lettuce from California or cucumbers from Mexico or something. So the whole idea is like, what is it that we still have to eat, uh, you know, in the wintertime that's growing in the field that's been stored, but also these, tr you know, traditional preservation methods that we can be eating. And of course, wanting to, you um, support natives that are growing these really interesting things that are flavors that we don't even like know about. Like you're talking about combinations of things that I would not um, put together and I wouldn't, it wouldn't cross my mind. I went to one dinner once that uh, uh, after the variety showcase, which is an event that happened here in Portland, uh, it was um, Carlos Baca, uh, Brian Yazi and, and Rowan organized. And I went to that dinner and I mean, I, I can't, it's almost like I can like remember what I ate because it was so unusual. It was things that I had never been exposed to at all. And I've, you know, I've eaten out a lot, <laughs> you know, I've got a lot of cookbooks and I was like, this is just amazing flavor combinations and um, really lovely. And so, and you've mentioned some of those today that are just quite different than what we normally run across. Um, I'm just checking the comments. Everyone's loving it and feels inspired. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, I mean, that's a, another good thing about going to these conferences and, and having the opportunity uh, pending finances sometimes to travel around to go to other tribes and, and learn about how they cook foods and prepare and store our traditional foods because it's that intertribal trade route. It's that knowledge that we've always traded and passed on different nutritional uh, items too mm -hmm. that we start to incorporate um, that are healthy for us versus um, sugar and flour that were kind of introduced to the tribes, at least up in Nome, Alaska and the Arctic where our culture is from. It just it immediately just went south after that. Mm -hmm. um, so having these healthy foods, having the opportunity to go teach and learn from others around regionally or around the country is incredible. That's our only way to kind of see each other. And it's not even COVID. It's just, um, there's not a lot of uh, Inupiaq people here in Bend, Oregon, or probably in Oregon. I've met a few already and I'm really excited about it, but now it's COVID and I can't visit, but um, we need to be able to communicate and share our cultures and oral traditions because we're losing our languages, our dialects and our, our traditions. So bringing everyone together with food always seems to be the best way. Yes. Yeah, you know, uh, Michelle talked about that a lot in learning the, the Sinai language that has been just lost and how, and how challenging it is to, to learn it. I mean, it's already very difficult to learn a language even if you have all the resources and the apps and all the things, but when there's a language that is gone, um, for the most part and having to kind of piece it together and, and figure out how to learn this language that is so important to connect us to um, our past and our ancestors and our food and really just bring it all together. Um, do you still speak your native language? 
No, um, my father was part of that generation um, that had their language taken away from them mm -hmm. um, because Alaska is a newer state. So we mm -hmm. don't have hundreds of years of oppression. It was just within the last 50 to 100 years. So he wasn't allowed to speak his language. Um, I have been self-taught by myself and then I know slang. I know things that aren't nice to say or things I've been called mm. or, you know, Gusak, which means white girl. Like, so I know things that aren't appropriate, unfortunately, mm. but it's not, I'm not from that generation where you can go ask them because they've spent their whole lives hiding that they're native or how they look. Um, and then there's this new generation of, if you don't look native enough, which happens to me quite a bit because I'm part German and part native. So I never look brown enough or native mm. enough. I don't know enough. So I'm in the middle of that cultural trauma, that generational trauma where, you know, everyone's like, do you remember your language? I know how I can sing it because I used to um, dance a lot. I have regalia and would do our traditional dances in Alaska when I was younger, but I can sing it, but I can't fluently speak it other than slang, mm -hmm. unfortunately. And there's no one around me to teach me unless I start meeting more Inupiaq um, men and women around here or at a conference that we could start to share stories yeah. and make fun of each other in a comical way mm. <laughs> to learn that. So what we've done with our food products is I started naming things in Inupiaq, like some of our teas and products mm -hmm. to force people to go, what is that? How do you say that? What does that mean? So they either have to look it up and a lot of it you can find if you just do an Inuit to English translation online. Mm -hmm. But um, I just wanted people to learn it, you know, so that they can understand what the food is inside. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Um, well, I think that, I mean, it's, I mean, you mentioned like, you know, I just think that there's so much grief in all of these, you know, the things that we've lost um, and particularly um, in the native community, um, the suppression and the, and, you know, just the traditions, the language, all of the things that um, have, have been lost. And it's just so beautiful to see so many individuals, including yourself and the two other speakers that we've had that are keeping these things alive and, and sharing this with us. Um, and we will definitely support you in all the ways that you um, would like us to. And I want to encourage, we're oh, at the end of time, but I want, oh, was that? Um, oh, thank you. It feels great to hear that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, this, this is really inspiring and it's wonderful. I'm very excited about the different ways to use squash. I'm so excited to learn more about uh, native food and these combinations of flavors and what the products are. Um, I know I'm going to go online. I've been, I already was like, why haven't I placed an order yet? Cause I saw lots of things I, <laughs> I want to try out. So I encourage everyone who's watching to jump online and see, um, all the wonderful things that you, you grow and you make. And I really appreciate all of your work. I look forward to learning more, more from you and all the different things that you're going to be presenting in the future, because I know that you are quite popular um, in doing a lot of uh, presentations. <laughs> and it yeah. sounds like you do so many things and have so much uh, knowledge to share. And I really appreciate you sharing with us today here. Yeah, thank you for having me. And, and I have a lot to learn too. Um, so I always say that teaching is learning for me. So it's not like I know everything. Um, a lot of it's been self-taught or passed down. Um, can't get it in a book which I think is great. You have to get hands-on and communicate and use eye contact and engage with people like the old days. And that's something that we're missing. It seems to be recently uh, generational, but I do appreciate your time. And I've learned a lot from the people that have asked me questions too. It's provided some curiosities and insight on my end of how to be more knowledgeable. I need to go look up how to use leaves now. <laughs> I feel like I'm in trouble. But oh, oh, yeah, thanks for your time too. I mean, we have so, I mean, there's all these questions that are asked and I always use the, that we have like, you know, this guy that was on for uh, garlic week and, you know, he's been studying garlic for 40 years and all, all these questions come in. He's like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's perfectly fine not to know because you have yeah. like this audience of people that are just throwing all these right. questions at you. <laughs> so yeah. um, no, no need to be worried about that. Um, yeah, so, well, thank you for 
for everything today, for sure. And I, I get to hang out with you guys hopefully again next month doing some seed work. Yes, that would be great. Um, we are on that. So uh, one thing that Spring is doing is she's going to be on the Slow Food Portland uh, seed panel on International Women's Day. International Women's Day is actually on the 8th of March, but this is going to be on Sunday the 7th. Um, but um, yeah, join us then. We'll talk about seed. And we actually will, next week, we have a week off for the winter vegetable sagra. And then we have the variety showcase the week of February 22nd. Um, so I hope that people join us and we will have many hours every day of Zoom interaction with plant breeders. And I'll have that, um, that schedule up online and on Instagram pretty soon. Um, so thanks for everyone for joining this spring, just in case you ever want to show any, share this recording with anyone, it's going to be on the Culinary Breeding Network YouTube site and you can show uh, how you made squash and people that are watching can share with friends. So thank you so much for joining thank us. You. Okay, take care. Yeah, thank you. Bye.